So, what you have the pleasure of listening to right now is the Iliac Suite for String Quartet played by the Frates Quartet from Moscow. And this piece of music was actually the first ever piece of music to be written up by a computer. And it was written by this computer. This is a mechanical computer. And Lerjan Hiller programmed this computer back in 1957 to create the music you just heard. It was created using a Monte Carlo simulation, which uses probability-based algorithms to generate the musical score you just heard. Now, these days, we would probably call that AI. Back then, it was just mathematics and statistics. So welcome. We are going to go on a journey around the world we live in and throughout the world of computer music throughout the ages. So ladies and gentlemen, this is High Scores, a brief history of computer music. Welcome along. And it's a story that starts in Australia. And it starts with this computer you're seeing here. This is a Cicerac computer, which was one of the few computers around in the world in the post-war years. This was a serial computer, which ha means that everything happened in sequence. So it was single-threaded, sort of like Node. Uh, and in 1950, this computer had no sort of user interface, but it had one thing. It had a speaker connected to it to allow the programmers to know when a program had finished running. So it go, went bleep, and, Carry on. and this, some of the engineers working on this computer figured out that they could modulate the sounds and the pulses being sent to this little loudspeaker connected to the computer, and then this happened. Marching band music was all the hype in the post-war years, and this is Colonel Boogie's March, and it was actually a pop hit at the time. People used to listen to marching band music all around the world, not only in Germany. And um, hence, this became the first ever computer to play music. So luckily, this started in Australia, and not in the United States of America, where all of these stories tend to start, but we have to go to the United States as well. And at Bell Laboratories, there was an engineer in his early 30s called Max Matthews, who was working on making noises with computers, which is kind of relevant if you're a telephone company. Uh, but he was a creative sort of guy, so he sat down with some of his colleagues and tried to program the IBM 704 to actually compose music. And it sounded like this. A great piece of music concrete called Silver Scales. Uh, so it's just sort of random bleeps and bloops and noises. But this was a huge step forward for computer music. Because whenever we talk about domain-specific languages, the one example that we always bring up is music. It's sheet music, right? Because if you can read sheet music, you can play just about any kind of music. And what Max Matthews did was that he created the first ever domain-specific programming language for music. So he created something called Music One, which was based on assembly language for the IBM. And it was written to create music. And this music was actually also the first music ever to be released on a vinyl album by Decca a few years later in the early 1960s on this album right here, Music from Mathematics. Let's go to Putney, where Peter Zinoviev has a hobby which is strictly for boffins. He keeps it in his garden shed, and it's called Digital PDP 8 Oblique S. Yes, it's a computer, and it has a hobby too, composing music. Peter helps with 
the ideas, but the actual performance is all digital as well. So, Peter Sinoviev, working in his garden shed in Great Britain, and he had loads of gear in his garden shed for being a hobbyist. He had a digital PDP computer. And with this, he created another programming language in the mid-60s called Musis. It looks like this. It's a macro assembly language where you could specify notes by a number and then the attack and the decay of the note. And he pieced this together with sort of algorithms to create music. And he was not afraid of showing this to the world. So he took this with him to the Royal Elizabeth Hall. The next item, Partita for Unattended Computer by Peter Zinoviev, is a true live performance in the sense that no magnetic tape is being used at all. Furthermore, the computer has a choice at various stages in the procedure, and the piece therefore comes out different every time it's played. The performance you're about to hear is therefore unique and unrepeatable. First of all, checks are made to see that the composition is correctly loaded into the computer. The computer is started and will carry out the performance unattended. So, in the Netherlands, techno music is quite popular, isn't it? This is sort of proto-techno. Bleeps and bloops created by a computer, but this is really important, because in January 1968, when Peter Sinovayev took this with him to the Royal Elizabeth Hall in London, this was a sell-out gig, and it made a big impact on the music scene in London and the cultural scene there. It didn't get the best of reviews, though. Um, <laughs> there were some positive ones, but something like the London Times wrote, technically, it may be a triumph of skill and knowledge, but what we heard resembled the dreariest kind of neo weapon drawn out to inordinate length. And for the less cultured among you, neo weapon refers to the Austrian composer Anton von Webern, who was known for making atonal music in the early 19th century. The sort of industry press was a bit more amused by this. Uh, you had magazines like Wireless Weekly, who wrote rave reviews, page up and page down, about this performance. But what was important about this was that for the first time ever, there had been a computer on stage performing music live and it was not recorded onto tape as the things that they were doing at Bell Laboratories in the United States of America. Because everything there was recorded. And one of the things they recorded was a sort of sweet little piece of music that you'll hear quite soon. But we have to talk about it first. Because Bell Laboratories, they are still a telephone company. And one of the things that Math Matthews and his team was working on at this time was making the computer speak. And together with his colleagues here, Carol Luckbaum at Frontier painstakingly programmed every single wow of the song you're about to hear into the computer to make the computer sing. A bicycle built for two. A hit from the early 19th centuries, now sung by a computer. And this might sound familiar to some of you. And since we're in a movie theater, my instructor was Mr. Langley, and he taught me to sing a song. 
If you'd like to hear it, I can sing it for you. Sing it for me. It's called Daisy. Daisy, Daisy. Give me your answer to one of the most iconic death scenes in all of film history. When the intelligent computer Hal dies, and as he draws his final electrons, he sings a beautiful song about a bicycle built for two. So people had taken notice of what was happening in the computer music scene. And as we leave the 1960s, with this great head nod to the engineering work that had been done. We can go into the heyday of the 1970s. Now, you might not think of Space Invaders as having music. It has a four note loop that keeps on going, but think about it. Boop, boop, boop. This is the first time ever that music was used to create an emotional response from the player. Because as the spaceships approach your little cannon, music goes faster and faster, induces stress in the player, making him make those little mistakes that will kill him, and make him put on another quarter and play another round. And this is the trick taken from a film that was released a few years before, Steven Spielberg's classic Jaws. It's the same thing. And music would be way better in computer games just a few years later. This is the classic game Rally X. And this was the first game ever to feature an actual musical score. Toshio Kai, who wrote the music for this, wrote this music down on a piece of paper for Kazuo Kurusu to program into the computer in hexadecimal code. This then went on to be re released on an album on Yen Records in Japan in 1984 called Video Game Music, which was the first ever compilation of video game music to be released. These days, every single video game soundtrack has a proper release, and most of them are also available on vinyl. So this is where that started. A true relic, this one. This is a rather rare game for the Atari 2600. It's called the Music Machine, and this was only sold in Christian bookstores. I kid you not. And it had music, as you would expect from a game called Music Machine, but how they managed to create music on this thing is a wonder. Because this had a sound processor. It had a five-bit sound processor, which means that you can only have 32 different frequencies you could play. That didn't really correlate with the Western scale, so everything was sort of out of tune. And to make things even worse, the sync from the television sort of affected the performance as well. So nothing sounded good. It was obvious that the world deserved something better. Let's you play hundreds more games with any video machine, plus draw, program, even do music. I'm more alive than ever before, and my friends are knocking down my door. It's now we're into so much more. We're into our Commodore 64. 64. Yes, the Commodore 64 with the classic MOS Technologies 6581 sound processor. And this processor was designed by Robert Jans, and he said that he thought the sound chips on the market, including those in Atari computers, were badly designed and very primitive and had obviously been made by people who knew nothing about music. So he set out to create something based on the designs of the synthesizers that were market leading at the time. Originally, this was intended to have 32 channels. Because of time constraints, it ended up having only three. 
but it still has the capacity to play 32 channels. So if you have a Commodore 64 and are willing to take it apart, you can stack this on top and get more channels. So there's a hobby project for some of you. Uh, so the Commodore 64 was a revolution because it was a big sea change for what you could do with computer music. And this is one of the earliest games for the Commodore 64. It's called Mew. And if you look at the oscilloscopes, you see that you have three different channels, and you have sort of the same waveform in each of the channels. Now this sort of sounds quite good, but it doesn't sound like this. Yes, Commando by Rob Hubbard from a few years later, because now programmers had learned how to manipulate the hardware in the Commodore 64 computer. And as you can see, things are way more busy. There are loads of things happening, and they are interpolating things in between, putting different instruments on the same tracks, twisting the little things. And everyone who has ever touched a synthesizer knows that the real funky sounds come when you play around with the knobs and fiddle with it. So, Rob Hubbard changed the way you made music with a computer by being a really clever programmer. So why on earth does this from the same year sound like this? Nothing wrong with Koji Kondo, but yeah. The reason is, the reason is this. The Nintendo had five channels, but it was predefined what sort of sounds the channels could play. So you had two square waves, you had a triangle wave, and you had a noise wave. You also had a PCM sample channel, which was a waste of space since Nintendo cartridges didn't have enough space to so store any samples, so that was never used. So this is the big difference between the Commodore 64 and the Nintendo, and why the Commodore 64 reigns supreme. So supreme that in 1999, a Swedish synthesizer manufacturer called Electron bought up the surplus stock of the SID sound chips and created this beauty. This is a SID station, which is a synthesizer based on the Commodore 64 sound processor. And this has been used by many, many people. If you ever listen to Daft Punk, the Swedish artist Robin, or the Norwegian electro pioneers we are listening to now, Rakesop, you've heard this instrument being used. And this, incidentally, is the flip side to Rakesop's first ever single, and it's called the 64 position. So they grew up in their bedrooms playing around with the Commodore 64 computer and went on to become worldwide musical stars. And their career started in Chris Hilsbeck's bedroom in Germany. This is 17-year-old German Chris Hilsbeck and his piece called Shades. Now, Chris Hilsbeck entered into a music programming contest in a German computer magazine when he was 17 years old, and he created this. It sounds great. The thing he did the year after, he created this piece of software called the Sound Monitor, which was the first ever software to actually make people able to create music the way the computer understands it. So before this, you had music software, but it was all about notation. This was about the hardware playing the music. And this happened elsewhere, also in Germany. This is Jochen Hippel, working on the Atari ST, which was one of the computers I had. I was fooled by Atari's marketing, because this computer was marketed as having a Yamaha sound processor. And Yamaha being my favorite sort of combined motorbike and synthesizer producer, um, I sort of bought into that. Now, this was an inferior sound chip. It only had three square, square waves and very limited volume control. But Jochen Hippel, 16 years old, was a wizard. He knew how to program this, and he was very inspired by the work of Rob Hubbard. So he managed to fool that piece of hardware into making really, really funky sounds. Ah, this sounds great. There was one computer at the time, though, that reigned supreme. That was sort of the gold standard for what you could have. And that was, of course, the Commodore Amiga. Yeah. Give it up. 
So Jay Miner, the manager for Commodore, was way beyond Steve Jobs. When Steve Jobs designed the first Macintosh, he, he allowed his engineers to sign the inside of the cabinet. Jay went further. Jay allowed his engineers to name the components in the computer after their second others. So what you're hearing now is the Paula sound processor, named after the girlfriend of the guy who designed it. And this is a piece of software called a sound tracker. And it's one of the great pieces of music by Danish Jesper Kid, and it's called Global Crash. And this really made this sort of music making available to the general public. And this cr created a wave of homegrown computer music growing into the scene. But before we can leave that scene, we have to revisit a classic game, Turrican 2. And just listen to the sound. This was just made for the Amiga. The Amiga had a limit on four audio channels. The music here has seven. And this is where the marvelous teenage engineering skills of Chris Hilsbeck and Jochen Hippel meet. Because Chris Hilsbeck used the algorithms that Jochen Hippel had designed to be able to play Amiga music on the Atari ST on the Amiga, making it available to have as many tracks as you wanted. And that certainly turned home computers into a home studio. So, this might be familiar because this was a pop hit. And this is uh, from Calvin Harris' debut album from 2006. Calvin Harris went on to be one of the great producers in the world and has loads of platinum records at his wall in his studio now. But back when he did this, he had limited means and he created this great piece of music and a Commodore Amiga 1200 computer and that was acceptable in the 80s. So... Earth, a scientist creates the ultimate machine. At last! A machine that will give him the power to journey into the mega world with thousands of colors, 16-bit graphic technology, and 10-channel mega stereo sound. Mega stereo sound. The most advanced video game system in the universe. Yes! Mega Drive oh from Sega. The Sega Mega Drive. This, this was a special little game console, because this was powered by this sound processor. And where or not you had a Sega Mega Drive, you've all heard this. Because this, this is the sound chip that was in Yamaha's DX7 synthesizer. And that is the synthesizer being played on AHA's huge hit, Take On Me. So you all heard this one. So suddenly, computer musicians had the same tools at their disposal as AHA had when they created one of the biggest hits ever. And boy, did people make great music with this. This is the game Street Fighter 2, and Yoko Shimura's soundtrack here started a new trend of using music to build the backstories to characters, because in a fighting game, there's not only so much you can do to give the characters a personality, and she used music in a real clever way to make that happen. And by the way, in 2015, this was remastered and released on vinyl through Bandcamp. It sold out in two hours. But this changed things, because suddenly we had different ways of making music for computer games. And this is a classic game called Monkey Island 2. The music here is by Michael Lan. And Michael Lan was frustrated of the way he created music for the first Monkey Island band, because it was only background music. So he wanted music to adapt to the gameplay. And here as Guybrush Streetwood walks around Scab Island, the music is going to change and adapt to the gameplay. And this was done by using the game engine's music part as a pit orchestra who could adapt to the gameplay and the behavior of the player. And that opened up for a way more immersive experience. 
let's go to the bleak side of things. So this is Wipeout from the original first edition of the Sony PlayStation. Music is by the Prodigy, it's the Firestalker, and this was dark days for computer music. It was good times for the music industry because they could have their bands in games. That saved the British band Ashes sort of failing second album. But it was just background music. It didn't adapt to the gameplay. And for that to happen, we needed inferior hardware. So this is Goldmine 64 from the Nintendo 64 at the same time. Now, the Nintendo 64 didn't even have a sound processor, but it was capable of playing rather high-res sounds, but it couldn't store those kind of samples in the memory. So for this soundtrack, with John Barry's classic James Bond soundtrack sort of mixed up with the drums from Fate No More's We Care A Lot, they recreated a soundtrack that sounds great, but using the techniques that were invented in the 1980s by guys like Chris Hilsbeck and Jochen Hippel. So this is sort of throwback and it goes to show that innovation happens when you have limited means. And another interesting thing, an iconic game from the Nintendo 64 is this one, it's Mario 64. And in this game, we saw the introduction of algorithmically generated music. And this happens here, in the level called The Endless Staircase. Because what you're hearing now is a musical algorithm, and it's, a, it's an auditory trick where, called the Shepherd Scale. And if you listen, the music just keeps going up, 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 and it never stops. It never stops going on up. And this is your mind being fooled. There are two sort of octaves moving in parallel and looping around. And this was programmed. This wasn't written because this is hard to play. So the start of algorithmic music, which was something that had been around for a while. This is the iPhone app, Bloom, by Brian Eno. And it was released just after the, the App Store opened in 2008. And this allows you to create your own generative music based on algorithms. And this was something that Brian Eno had started with when he released this album, Ambient Music for Airports, back in 1978, which was the first ever ambient album. And Brian Eno took this with him when he scored the video game Spore. So you can hear music is quite similar. And it's created in a visual programming language called Pure Data where you can sort of set up different components and string them together and have the variables being changed and the music adapting and reacting to that. There's only one downside with this kind of music and it tends to be a bit dull. It's a bit flat, it's boring. And that was a problem to be tackled in the game No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky was scored by the math rock band 16 Days of Static. And being a math rock band, they sort of were familiar with algorithms, computers, and how things work. But what they wanted was to create a soundtrack that had more intensity to it and that adapted to what was happening on screen. And this being a universe of 18 quintillion different worlds, there are endless possibilities of things happening in the game, and there are also endless possibilities of how the music can be arranged and, and replayed and remixed on the fly. So the computer here is more like a jazz band than a classical orchestra, having an improvised session where you as a player is in control of how the music is being played. So that was a game changer, even if the game wasn't all that good. But the thing with established musical artists making music for video games was nothing new. This is the game Quake, and it has a soundtrack by the Nine Inch Nails. And it's a really gritty industrial rock soundtrack. 
that sort of fits the atmosphere in the game really nicely. So this is one example. Another one that few people are aware of is that David Bowie created the music for video games. This is a game called Omnicron, and David Bowie's in there. So the late, great David Bowie with a song that never was released on an album. It's only available when you get to this scene in the game. And he also did voiceovers. So big artists have been doing this. This is a Sega classic. The game Moonwalker featuring Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson music. Michael. The plot here was to, for Michael to go around in buildings and pick up kids. Wasn't the best of ideas in hindsight. Uh, but it's obviously Michael Jackson's music in there. Smooth criminal playing in the background. So Michael Jackson was involved with Sega, but what, what few people know is that he was way more involved than what he has been credited for. So this is the soundtrack for Sonic 3, Sonic and Knuckles, laid on top of Michael Jackson's Stranger in Moscow. So it's just the two songs mixed together. No remixing, they're just on top. And they fit perfectly. Because Michael Jackson did write the music for Sonic 3 game. But he didn't like, even if it was in 10 channel mega stereo sound, he didn't like the way it sounded. It was way too low fire for him, so he didn't want to be credited. But the Sonic game was released two years prior to Stranger in Moscow, so yeah, Michael Jackson did write that music. So one of the big album releases this summer was the soundtrack to a video game. The soundtrack to Red Dead Redemption 2. And this featured major artists like Rihanna Giddens that we're hearing here. But it was also a revolution for how video game music was made. Because they recorded more than 70 hours of music, but they didn't just record the music, they also wrote it so it could be pieced together in different order. And there were 16 different tracks of music that the game engine can bring out to sort of create the ambience that fits the gameplay. So you can have sort of quiet music with strings going on, and then you engage in sort of battle, and you hear the drums starting to beat, you hear elements come into the music, and the music changes dynamically throughout the gameplay. And in Red Dead Redemption, this was done masterfully. And Western games sort of sets the tone for the future of video game music. Because this here is AI generated music played by an AI. This is MuseNet by OpenAI. And it's a neural network that creates country and western music. And it sounds sort of convincing. It's a bit flat. It sounds like a demo track on so, some cheap keyboard. But the composition is sort of convincing. Not as convincing as this. So this is a, another project by a company called Flow Machines and a band called Shiga. Uh, this is a French band, and the French are known for making rather cheesy pop music. Uh, this is written by an AI trained on 1980s French pop songs. And the algorithms wrote all of the music. And it also wrote the lyrics. Grim after, after feel, grim after feel, more little, more little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's total so gibberish. It sounds like me, four this years old, trying thinking that I was speaking feel, English. Uh, but this is just one example. There is another project called Duke Tech, and Google has the Magenta project, which also writes music. And the reason why so many are getting involved in this is that a huge part of the income in the music industry at the time is through writer credits. If anyone recalls Travis Scott and Drake's hit from last year uh, called Sicko Mode, that song had 30 people on the writer credits list. 
So if you can come up with an AI that writes convincing pop music, you can get very rich. So folk music. This was obviously also AI generated, but folk music and AI work so perfectly because folk music is, has a long-standing tradition of just adapting the music that came before it. So the way folk music always has been written is the exact same way that AI writes music. And that's why this sounds so good, but it was played by humans. And all of the AI music around today sounds flat. It sounds good when it's played by humans. But whenever new technology comes into the music world, it changes the music world forever. And AI will obviously have a place in the future of music. But what that place is, I don't know. But maybe Bob Dylan does. Machines are making most of the music now. Uh, have you noticed that? Have you noticed that all the songs sound the same? I mean, I don't know if you've noticed that. I mean, that the, the, I mean, you could be hearing one song. I mean, you could take the lyrics from another song and put it right on to, uh, because the rhythms are the same. You know, the drum and the, and the, uh, the drones are the same. And they, uh, uh, the machines can only do so much. You know, they can only... You know, they can only make it sound different so many different kinds of ways. So it doesn't sound different, it sounds all the same. And uh, that's good for the, industry, uh, for the industry because a lot of people are invent these machines and need, you know, and sell these machines. Plus it's also very good because uh, you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can have your own little band, like a one-man a one -man band with these machines. You know what I mean? You can have your own little band with these machines. That was Bob Dylan in 19... 86, so who knows what the future of this is. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. This has been High Scores, a brief history of computer music. So if anyone of you want to talk about all of these geek and nerdy things, I'll stick around, come find me, and we'll have a good chat about that. Thank you. Anders Norvas, guys. And girls. <laughs>